Today's guests are Andrew Dare and Henry Daniel. We join their conversation in the faculty lounge. It's, it's an academic exchange of information, uh, but it's no longer the case. I cannot make any public disclosures mm -hmm. uh, until it is uh, fully submitted and patent protected. Okay. So, because you could say something in a presentation that could be the missing link for a researcher some other place to that's correct. complete development yeah, yeah, of something. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so, so we were talking about uh, the uh, how university professors can uh, really um, develop uh, intellectual property mm -hmm. that um, could eventually be commercialized. Right. And, uh, well, you're at no risk of me going to my lab in counselor education and finding the cure for HIV. <laughs> 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 but yeah. I do think it's interesting um, and I think it would be good to find out even you know how how can the Office of Research because they are proactive mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know I mean mm -hmm. I get emails you know from them saying hey we're having this discussion or this brown bag you know presentation on this issue with this person from NIH or SBIRs STTRs and and things like that but and I think some faculty, probably more from your area, um, you know, physics or chemistry or some of those, um, some of those disciplines where commercialization seems more intuitive. Mm -hmm. But you know, in education and counselor education, I don't think it's as intuitive for the average faculty person. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. and. Um, and it's almost seen, in my opinion, sometimes it's almost met with, you know, that's wrong. Mm, mm, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, you have developed yeah. this and you should just give it to the masses. Mm -hmm. But the way we mm -hmm. give things to the masses is we publish them in scholarly journals mm -hmm. that other scholarly people read, mm -hmm. usually to contribute to whatever scholarly thing that they're doing. And then there's this cycle of, <laughs> scholarly people talking to scholarly people while the average Jane and Joe out there in reality don't know any different. You know, we see this in um, career development. Um, saw a lot of it after 9-11 too where you had a lot of folks that would come out of the woodwork. I'm a career counselor. Well, you know, under different accrediting bodies for counseling programs, there's clear criteria for somebody to be a career counselor. Um, counseling, psychology, those fields are, you know, protected by state law, but a career counselor, anybody can call themselves a career counselor. Mm -hmm. And so you have folks that are doing that. Some folks are even packaging models, mm -hmm. particularly online, you know, which I think is one easy way to commercialize a product, um, particularly in our area where it's not something that comes in a vial. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know, be nice if there was a vial, you know, for, well, I guess they do have vials for more significant uh, psychiatric issues, but... Um, but not for choosing the right career. But not, not for choosing <laughs> the right career. Yeah. I mean, you have programs... Um, you have online programs, you have assessments, and so in those areas, you do have, you know, things that are being produced and commercialized, but even if you get into more, I, I don't, I'm not sure if the word softer interventions, but um, effective methods or models for talk therapy, you know, how do you commercialize that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. See, for uh, in our field in uh, biomolecular science or molecular biology, there are uh, extraordinary uh, examples. For example, 
um, the uh, UC Berkeley professor uh, founded Genentech, mm -hmm. and uh, Genentech is a multi-billion dollar company. You know, uh, last year, for, uh, for example, they sold uh, insulin for $10 billion. Mm -hmm. And um, even locally uh, in Florida, we have examples of the cancer uh, drug um, that was uh, created Florida State. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Florida State has made millions of dollars every year. And in fact, Florida State ranks within the top 10 in the country. So there are many, many um, such uh, examples uh, in, in our field. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in my case, I founded uh, Clorigen, mm -hmm. which is the first uh, biotech company uh, at UCF, mm -hmm. founded from research done at UCF. And we received multi-million dollar uh, funding um, uh, last year. Um, from to, private investors. Uh, from private investors. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but the technology itself was developed with federal money, funding from National Institutes of Health and mm -hmm. U.S. Department of Agriculture. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, uh, the federal agencies fund the basic research mm -hmm. to develop the proof of concept. But then from there, if someone is committed to take that invention to the people all the way. Uh, in my case, for example, I'm very much committed to developing these vaccines um, for Africa, for India. I grew up in India, so I have personally experienced the need mm -hmm. uh, for, uh, for vaccines. And our other uh, therapeutic proteins, I mean, we have diabetes is uh, one among the, you know, um, important diseases mm -hmm. and um, last year actually in the US uh, insulin related products were sold for 20 billion dollars wow. and uh, diabetes is one of the you know uh, um, US spends more on diabetes than all types of cancers combined wow. and um, but if you look at the global picture mm, in the world of 6 billion people Two billion people earn less than two dollars a day, and uh, recently, when I went to Kenya, I had to take uh, four um, vaccine shots before uh, to get a visa to go there. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I came back, I had an invoice from the doctor's office for nine hundred dollars. The average income there is two dollars. Um, a, a day, right. and uh, what is the point in having these four vaccines costing thousand right. dollars when it's stored in the refrigerator here? Mm -hmm. But in fact, it is needed there right. uh, for people to live. So this is the disparity that I see. Uh, even other diseases like cancer or mm -hmm. hepatitis, in the U.S., it costs twenty-six thousand to forty thousand dollars to treat a person for four months. And um, this is because interferon mm, is so expensive here. Mm -hmm. And um, whereas 800 million people around the world suffer hepatitis. Mm -hmm. mm, so basically all these inventions are uh, made and the solutions are here, but it's really not available to right. the majority of the people. Right. So, so that has been one of the uh, major goals of uh, my lab mm -hmm. to really find cheap, mm -hmm. less expensive uh, vaccines mm -hmm. are, um, are these generic proteins like interferon or insulin. Mm -hmm. And then, but how are, or how, how are you able to protect, and I'm not sure if protect is the right word, because you do have investors on the, mm -hmm. on the commercialization side, mm -hmm. so how do, I mean, you you can pr uh, produce something, you know, for a percent or a few percent of the cost of maybe some of the more expensive products, but then in getting it to some of these developing countries, how do you prevent against your own investor saying, well, you know, if interferon it costs forty thousand to do a course of treatment using that drug. We'll just cut it in half to twenty thousand, or we'll even 
one fourth of it will make yeah. it ten thousand, yeah. yeah. which is still cost yeah. prohibitive yeah. Yeah. for most folks in developing yeah. countries. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is a very good question. You know, I have been struggling with this question too. So it's not only the technology, it goes beyond uh, mm -hmm. delivering the technology to mm -hmm. the people who need it. But the technology itself right now is flawed because the way insulin or interferon is delivered, first, um, it's produced in fermentation systems like E. coli or yeast. Mm -hmm. These fermenters cost $900, $800 million to build. Mm -hmm. So if you build 10 such fermenters, then the investors who make that kind of an investment up front want 10 or 20 times more of that money. Right. So there is a flaw in the way the these therapeutic proteins are produced right now. Mm -hmm. That's number one. And second cost is that once it is produced in the fermentation system, they have to be purified to 99.999% go through all the uh, clinical trials mm -hmm. and uh, to purify it to such a refined level um, takes a lot of money mm -hmm. because uh, most of those techniques are very expensive. Mm -hmm. And then once you purify it, those proteins are highly unstable. So you have to put it in a refrigerator, you have to ship it in a refrigerator truck, mm -hmm. and if you're shipping it to Africa or India, you know, it goes across the oceans, mm -hmm. and then you need uh, uh, physicians to deliver it. Mm -hmm. The technology that we have developed um, eliminates a fermenter because we are now producing insulin and interferon in uh, plants. Actually, right. we have chosen tobacco plants mm -hmm. because it is uh, cheap. One acre of tobacco can produce 40 metric tons of leaves. Mm -hmm. So you can repeatedly harvest them. You don't have to plant them again and again and again. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have found a solution at the upfront. Mm -hmm. So we have um, published recently that uh, with the NIH, NIH did these studies uh, that anthrax vaccine one acre of tobacco can produce 400 million anthrax vaccine. Right now, the U.S. production capacity is limited only to the military. Mm -hmm. Not only that, it contains uh, some, uh, it has some problems. Uh, some of the Gulf War syndrome was traced back to the anthrax vaccine because it contains some toxin. Mm -hmm. We have removed completely the toxin from the vaccine because we are producing it in plants. So that is one part of the solution. The other part is uh, you don't have to purify this at all. If you produce this in uh, carrots or in lettuce, mm -hmm. then you can powder the leaf, put them in a capsule, mark the dosage, then if you don't purify it, the cost will come down to pennies right. as opposed to um, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. So we can do, um, uh, we can significantly or dramatically reduce the production cost. So mm -hmm. that certainly adds to the cost. But you asked a very good question, even if it is done that, then what if the producers mark up the price? Mm -hmm. So it's still, you know, the, how do you control the price? Mm -hmm. And this is where foundations like Rockefeller and Gates uh, Foundation mm -hmm. can come in and help advance this technology and then keep it uh, from the private sector mm -hmm. investing into this and then controlling the price. Mm -hmm. um, either the, the government could do it, but then government has a lot of other important things right. to do. So this is where actually Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Rockefeller, they all are investing mm -hmm. in making these vaccines in a less expensive manner mm -hmm. and then taking it uh, to the people. Mm -hmm. So both efforts are going on. On the one hand, the foundations are trying to help advance this technology so that we can keep the cost down, mm -hmm. but then from UCF's point of view, UCF has done its part by contributing uh, a, a vital uh, technology. Mm -hmm. And then, so when it gets to, let's just say Kenya, mm -hmm. then are there, are there limitations or roadblocks or boundaries in dealing with the governments or or does a company have to deal with the governments directly or is it a situation where the company is pretty much just trying to get it to the shelves? I mean, is the government 
yeah. in these yeah. developing yeah. countries yeah. 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 playing a role like yeah. I imagine why not um, why not take these tobacco plants and get one acre in Kenya? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, absolutely. Actually, the governments play a very vital role because, first of all, the governments should, these are called genetically modified plants. Mm -hmm. So to grow these genetically modified plants, each government has their own guidelines, mm -hmm. where it should be grown, how it should be contained, and so on. And uh, that's why uh, next month, actually, Rockefeller has uh, organized a roundtable conference inviting ambassadors from 15 different developing countries. Mm -hmm. And I've been invited to the roundtable conference where the government has to now set the framework how they are going to do this. Um, uh, so each government has its own challenges and you know uh, limitations and so mm -hmm. on. So you are absolutely right. So we not only need the help of some private foundation to take it to the people. Fortunately, mm -hmm. this is not a very high cost demanding technology. You're mm -hmm. just growing plants, grinding them up, powdering, putting in a capsule and selling it. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't involve any high tech um, industry construction. Mm -hmm. But it needs a lot of regulatory framework right. uh, and that it needs to be regulated. Um, and the, the diseases that we have chosen uh, are intentionally to meet the needs of the challenges in developing countries. Right. So the top five that we are working with are tuberculosis, HIV, malaria, yeah, and uh, diarrheal diseases like cholera and mm -hmm. amoebiasis and so on. Mm -hmm. So the, the choice. But then we are also developing insulin and interferons and so on, which are really uh, in great demand. Mm -hmm. But this, uh, um, not, we also need it. You know, even in the U.S., you come to think of it, there are more than 40 million Americans without insurance. Right. So any one of them are essentially uh, in the same situation as in developing countries. Right. And so this round table um, with the ambassadors, that's more to have representatives from that country work mm -hmm. to develop a consistent mm -hmm. infrastructure mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that when this cost-effective product is brought to them, mm -hmm. then it can be efficiently and mm -hmm. effectively mm -hmm. distributed, yeah. ideally, to the yeah. masses. The main focus of this particular roundtable, uh, this is going to be in Bellagio in Italy, mm -hmm. is uh, Africa. Mm -hmm. So we have more representatives from Kenya, you know, from all, um, all over, even South Africa, which is, you know, mm -hmm. more advanced, um, uh, um, um, more advanced in some of these technologies uh, mm -hmm. than other parts of Africa. But we have more representatives from Africa for this, but we do have representatives from India and other developing countries as well, mm -hmm. ambassadors, yes. Okay. You know, it's kind of neat because as, as, as you're talking, I'm thinking about, you know, in the field of counseling and counselor education, which would include school counseling, you know, mental health, marriage and family, things like that. And I think about some of the things that we're doing and there's almost, I won't say an advantage, um, because clearly when you look at treating some of those global issues, there's no argument mm -hmm. on, on the significance of that. But it's nice when you have something that's packaged. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. You know, it's yeah. concrete, mm -hmm. you know, here is the result of my hard work, mm -hmm. and it's a vial that mm -hmm. cures something or a yeah. vial yeah. that yeah. treats something. Mm -hmm. And I imagine it's easier um, to make an argument for the need for funding to, you know, treat diabetes or mm -hmm. to treat, you know, cancer, um, which are clearly epidemics mm -hmm. to some extent, you know, but then I think about, you know, counseling. Yeah. It's like, yeah, what's yeah. that vial for us? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I noticed that, uh, you know, you, you teach a course on career development. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, um, you focus on a lot of different uh, career opportunities mm -hmm. and intervention opportunities. And so um, in, in that, one of the um, 
the topics that are related to, um, to our conversation that I was, uh, uh, I'm interested in is the, um, the high tech, um, I know there are different kinds of careers mm -hmm. and uh, in the uh, US, there is a general tendency to um, move away from science uh, uh, choosing science as a career mm -hmm. as opposed to business or uh, law, you know, mm -hmm. and several other careers. Mm -hmm. is, um, uh, yeah, even in Florida, I believe that the, um, the most number of graduates uh, are psychology mm -hmm. uh, graduates, right? And so do you have any, um, uh, uh, any comments why the, the interest is profoundly uh, even though you know US is one of the technologically mm -hmm. advanced countries but you tend to have more foreign scientists come in mm -hmm. at a PhD level or at the mm -hmm. master's level they get their education here mm -hmm. and um, the American citizens seem to be less um, profited or benefited mm -hmm. by all this technology innovation mm -hmm. there's probably a couple different ways and we could probably have a rich discussion from the standpoint of two immigrants moving to the United States and mm -hmm. perceptions mm -hmm. on education and things like that. My, you know, one thing that I think contributes particularly to, um, well, to that particular question, I think is career indecision. Mm. Most folks are not, um, the average college student doesn't have a concrete idea of what it is they want to do. Mm. In high schools, um, particularly in Florida, the role of the guidance counselor um, has significantly changed, mm. particularly in high school. And that's a big challenge in a counselor education program because, you know, I teach career and when I have when I have graduate students, because the program that I teach in it's masters and doctoral students, when I have master students who are aspiring to be a high school guidance counselor, questioning the relevance of taking a career development course, it makes you wonder because <laughs> if there's any course <laughs> yeah. that a high school guidance counselor yeah. should take, and you know, yeah. if you're gonna pick one course, yeah. I'm thinking now I'm biased, but mm. I'm thinking it should be, yeah. you know, career mm. development mm. because yeah. that's such that's such an important and a critical role. So I think it's a number of things happening. You've got the role of the guidance counselor shifted. Mm. You mm. know, a um, lot of guidance counselors in Florida, you know, are playing more administrative functions with mm -hmm. respect to FCAT. Um, you know, a lot of scheduling more administrative types of issues opposed to working on developing infrastructures within their schools to address career development and things of that nature. And it's not, to some extent, I mean, to some extent you could say, well, the guidance counselors need to work on being more innovative within the limitations that are presented to them from structures at a larger level, at a district level, at a state level. So on one level, the guidance counselors in the school have to own a piece of that. Um, but I think the decision makers at the district level and the state level, they also need to own a piece of that also. And, you know, how are we impacting the role of a guidance counselor? How is that impacting career decidedness for graduating students? Mm -hmm. And then when those students now are undecided and they go to college, mm -hmm. you know, what are you going to do? Psychology, mm -hmm. general mm -hmm. business, mm -hmm. probably the two, yeah, yeah, two, the two largest because, yeah. well, if I don't know what to do in liberal arts, mm. I'll just pick psychology. Oh, yeah. They're not going to yeah. pick molecular biology. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, and then if they're thinking more in the business sector, yeah. well, I don't know what I want to yeah. do, so I'm just yeah. going to go with general business. Yeah. So I think there's a larger economic ramification mm. of 
high school students not being more decided. Mm -hmm. yes. And we don't do a good job yeah, as yeah. Uh, researchers mm -hmm. because I don't think we have that background in economics mm -hmm. and business. Because mm -hmm. then you can get a liberal arts mm -hmm. education and not step foot yeah. in a business yeah. school. Yeah. You can't get a business education without stepping foot in yeah. some place in the liberal arts arena. So as researchers in that, s in that sector, we don't know how to tie it into economics, which is a mm -hmm. major component yeah, for yeah. decision makers. Yeah. I appreciate uh, you taking on that responsibility um, and pointing out about the researchers, but isn't there a greater role um, for parents, for example, because uh, let me give, uh, you know, since I grew up in India, I can give uh, a comment on that as well. Um, India, um, nobody, none of the schools have any course on counseling mm -hmm. and still um, India is one of the largest technically qualified people. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of debate now about outsourcing of high-tech jobs and mm -hmm. so on. So the general population tend to deviate towards, uh, more towards uh, uh, scientific or, you know, high-tech kind of jobs. And if you take in the U.S. itself, there are plenty of examples. Bill Gates, I mm -hmm. mean, um, the, the richest man in the world. You know, people see how technology can reward. And there was this dot-com revolution. And Microsoft made so many millionaires. Mm -hmm. So uh, still, our graduation um, rate in all this uh, mm -hmm. computer science and, and engineering is still largely international students mm -hmm. fill